and welcome those who have joined us to be part of this from the media and other uh, interested parties. I would like just to reflect that as we meet today, we, we learned of two of our ministers uh, that are in quarantine now in hospitals, Minister Nguessi and Minister uh, Mantashe. When we met last week, we had not um, uh, heard of the tragic uh, incident of one of the members of the provincial legislature of Khao Deng, who since passed on through the attack at his house. Uh, some of our relatives, Mamu Janji has a relative who is being buried today. Uh, many of us know relative friends, colleagues, family members who are not well quarantined or in hospitals or have passed on. Can we also continue to pray for our staff members who are doing an excellent job in their different hospitals, clinics and all over, both private and public hospitals. And therefore, as we start this meeting, we bow our heads to remember them and to pray for them and to pray for those families and wish that God can give them strength to continue supporting their loved ones and also be able to deal with the tragic losses of their loved ones. Just a moment of silence, please. Thank you very much, honorable members. May, may I therefore request uh, Mama Gillian to note and give us the, the members who are here. Uh, I have seen a lot, some of them from NCOP and maybe uh, also the, our secretaries to support us by reading the names of the members who are here. And then if there are any other apologies, let us note them. Thank you, I will mute for now and allow either uh, Honorable Gillian or our secretaries to take us through the issues of attendance and apologies. Good morning, Chairperson. Good morning, members. Um, Marcel, can you give an indication of the NCOP members present, please? Morning, Chairperson. Morning, members. For the NCOP, we have yourself, Chairperson, Ms. Maleka Nungeni Nchabaleng, Mr. Baha, Ms. Christians, Latuli, and Lahili. We have no apologies, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Can we also have the committee secretary from the National Assembly to give us the attendance in this meeting, please? Thank you, Chairperson. From the NA, we have Dr. S. M. Lomo, Dr. Gyanji. Ms. Kela, Dr. Jacobs, uh, Ms. Kwahube, Ms. Wilson, Mr. Van Staden. Mr. Sokacha is still struggling to connect. And on apologies, we have apology from Mr. Imam Sheikh. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairperson. So I've dealt with the apologies. I will hand over to you for the Oh, sorry, then we need a confirmation of attendance by the national and the provincial departments of health. Can I have that um, confirmation of attendance first by the national department of health? Is there anybody? in attendance from the Department of Health, National Department of Health. Chairperson. Yes. Good morning, uh, Chairperson. Good morning to the members of the Portfolio Committee. I'm Swongi Lezungu, and I am from the Department of Health, uh, posted to the province of Eastern Cape to the project management unit. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, the members from the de Provincial Department of Health, can we get the attendance? Can somebody just um, give us that attendance from your department? Morning, Chair. We are talking to the MEC of the Eastern Cape, uh, Cindy Swapomba. 
I need to explain, Chair, that U Dr. Mpisa is en route from airport to the hotel to connect. So he might be joining us as we get on. Thank you. Thank you, MEC, and welcome. I am here, of course, with Dr. Zungu as leader of the project management unit. Okay, thank you, thank MEC. You. Welcome to our meeting this morning. Thank you very much. Is Dr. Dlomo there? Yes, I'm here, my sister. Thank you. Okay, I will hand over to you, Doc. Okay. Le Honorable members, can I request that um, we, we accept the agenda as is? I'm also going to start on that one now. We are going to be on item number five. Uh, there's a letter that I received yesterday uh, from uh, Honorable Dimaza. Uh, of course, it was written to the House Chair um, uh, from him and it was copied to me. We then requested that uh, the matter be sent to the House Chair to request, firstly, the, the rules, because it impacts on the rules. If you change the agenda when it has already been forwarded to uh, the House Chair, then you need a permission of the House Chair, which he gave, that uh, in the light of um, not having uh, able to share challenges of the Eastern Cape with them, um, uh, provincial le legislature members who are in health, led by uh, Honorable Dimaza, we then, sw we then swap uh, the, uh, the, the items, but of course this was concurred with the Minister Mkise, hence uh, MEC Gomba is now saying to us, if uh, Dr Mkise, who is travelling from wherever he is to the Eastern Cape, is able to logistically log in, he will also log in, because this presentation that we are going to receive now is also from his office. There is a provincial management unit supporting Eastern Cape led by Dr. Zungu, who when I finish now is going to start uh, presenting, of course, being introduced by the MEC. There are challenges in our country regarding COVID. Eastern Cape is one of those that are challenged. Therefore, there's been a decision taken almost three weeks ago shared with the Premier of the Eastern Cape and Dr. Um, Kizem that he beefs up the management and the leadership of the Eastern Cape Department of Health uh, with this team that is led by Dr. Zungu. And therefore, it is actually a, a very good opportunity for us uh, maybe to hear what has been done, what are the challenges, rather than maybe to dwell too much on the challenges can they be able to guide us on their turnaround plan in regards to these issues? Because there are gaps uh, in terms of, um, what is this thing, field hospitals, th this and that and that. So I don't want to dwell too much into that. Uh, MEC Gomba is here because though this team reports to the Premier, reports to Minister Mkise, it also reports to the MEC. So she's aware of this uh, leadership that is on the ground supporting them. I was going to then give the space to Honorable MEC Gomba if she has opening remarks, and then thereafter Dr. Zungu will take over and present. They will indicate when Minister Amkize joins us, but he is well aware of this presentation. I've also shared with him and listened and saw this presentation yesterday, discussed it extensively with Dr. Amkize. Thank you very much, MEC Gomba. Your opening remarks, if you do have. Thank you, Dr. Romo, and morning to everybody, morning colleagues. I would not waste much time except to say, as the province, it is correct that there have been some interventions that have been made, and those interventions have actually drawn us to, after some assessment of our facilities, that we actually come up with a, a project team, and that team is led by Dr. Zungu, also, she is going to introduce the other members of the team. I would not waste time, Chair, but right away, I appreciate the opportunity to hand over to Dr. Zungo. Thank you very much. Dr. Zungo, thank you very much. Take over, Dr.
Eh, I Dr. Zungu Lapo Simlalele, Tombi Asimakaya. Who matter what there? Thank you, Chairperson. I hope I'm audible. Uh, very audible, yes. Your photo. <laughs> Check it, check it. We can hear you, Zoom, but we can't see you. Oops. She's muted, Chair. On, on my side, I'm not muted. We can hear you, can yes. Okay. Thank, thank you, Chairperson. And uh, thank you to the members of the portfolio committee, uh, our MEC, and uh, I, I would like to firstly um, thank this opportunity to present to the portfolio committee and to introduce my colleagues in the project management unit. I, I'm working with uh, Mr. Lawrence van Zetem. I hope he has uh, connected, and Dr. Monde Tom. Dr. Monde Tom uh, is a, a specialist in the finance management and he's heading the, biz the business continuity stream that we are working on. And uh, Mr. Lawrence van Zedem is handling the human resources component of the response. And on my side, I handle the clinical matters, the healthcare component of the response. And in this work, I have, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, um, I have uh, my Dr. Zungu, can you, switch on, can you switch on your camera, please? Uh, on my side, the camera is on and I see myself. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I'm not certain what... Uh, you don't see the presenter. Um, I, I, on my side, the camera is on, and I can see myself on the on on the screen. Can, can you see us? Otherwise, it's a mirror. I, uh, I can see. I, I don't know. Maybe I must change my sitting. I am with my co-presenter, which is uh, Professor Ian Sane, and uh, I don't know whether you can see us. I've switched on the light as well. Uh, we're not seeing you. Dr. Zungu, let me guide you. There is a name here, Sibongile Zungu. You are, you are not, you are able to speak to us. Your camera is on. The cameras that you can see now, I can see Minister Mkize. I see Van, uh, uh, Van Staden. There's also my camera is on. Yours is not on. Uh, Dr. Mkize is already on and his camera is there. Yeah, uh, and MEC Gomba can see. So switch on a gadget that shows your camera being on. I've, I've switched my camera uh, off, and it says turn camera on, and I've clicked it. It has turned the camera on. And yes, um, only, oh, yeah, I can see you now well <laughs> with your Oh, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what was happening, and oh, then uh, no, 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 thank you very much. Um, I am here, um, uh, chair, with uh, my co-presenter, Prof. Uh, Ian Sane, and my colleagues in the PMU is um, Dr. Mondetom and uh, Mr. Lawrence Van Zayden, and I hope they've been able to connect. So the presentation is joint and uh, we have resources that we work with in the province and uh, the resources on the financial side, we do have um, resources from CHAI um, and uh, we also have uh, a resource in a, a, a disaster medicine specialist uh, in Dr. Rufaro from CHAI and then we have resources from WHO 
and we have resources from TB HIV care and resources from MERGE and resources from right to care and resources from GIZ that are assisting different uh, districts in the province. Uh, Chairperson, I will then move to the presentation. And um, Zongo, uh, make sure your presentation is going to come up on the screen. Let me just interrupt you two things. Welcome, Honorable Minister Mkize. Thank you very much. You will indicate whether you want to greet now before Dr. Zungu starts, or you will do that later. I'll give it to you. <coughs> Number two, Dr. Zungu, you are presenting to the Portfolio Committee of Health in the National Ex Assembly and the Select Committee on Health and Social Services on the NCOP. So it's joint committees that are here, Dr. Zungu. I just thought I should mention that to you. Uh, let me then leave this to you and to Minister Mkize to decide. Uh, I'm sure it would be good just to hear him greeting us. Thanks. Minister Mkize. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zomo. Let me just take this off. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zomo and uh, members of the Portfolio Committee and members of the Select Committee. I uh, want to greet the uh, MEC and the provincial representatives, Dr. Zungu, and the uh, members of the team. Uh, I won't be long. I just want to say that uh, I did wish to be part of this discussion because we have, uh, in the past few weeks, been seeing quite a lot of challenges uh, coming from the Eastern Cape with the, with the rising numbers. And we took a view that we need to come and give a lot of support to the provincial uh, government. And in the process, there's been lots of discussion between myself and the MEC and the Premier and the uh, head of department so that uh, we should then focus on the challenges. Now, the team here led by Dr. Zungu, uh, Dr. Uh, Pro Professor Sana and the other members are going to be giving us a, an analysis of what the main challenges are, what areas we should prioritize. And I am here to also oversee the implementation of all of that, which uh, we've agreed with the, uh, with the Premier and the uh, MEC that we need to give attention to the issues of the hospitals, uh, the shortage of, of staff, the shortage of oxygen, the uh, you know, equipment issues, the challenges that are faced by the patients in terms of the quality of care. All of these issues, uh, we believe that uh, the pro province needs a lot of assistance, and therefore we are here for that. I won't be taking long. Uh, I'm actually already here with the MEC in the same room. We will therefore be following on the presentation. We will then at some point break off and move on with the program of trying to look at what's happening in the province. But at the moment, I think uh, it's important for us to just say uh, to, you, to yourself as the chair of the committee and the select, select committee that we do appreciate your oversight and your interest in the, in the uh, challenges that are facing this province. We are here to solve as much as possible of that. So I'll be able to uh, let the matter, uh, <clears throat> the, your, your issues, uh, back to you so that uh, the presentation can continue. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Minister Mkize. Uh, I now also noticed in the presence on the meeting, there's also Deputy Minister Pasha. Welcome, uh, Minister, Deputy Minister Pasha. Uh, I was not aware, uh, Minister Mkize, that you will really work like a soldier traveling from wherever you are to the Eastern Cape and still be able to connect. Thank you very much. We appreciate that also you are prioritizing meeting and greeting us, and therefore sometime later, we hope not to detain you longer than an hour so that you could go and do whatever support uh, staff uh, programs that you are going in there for. Now I'll hand over to Dr. Zungu, and I hope that our team from this parliament will be able to assist her to flight the slides that she wants to present. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Chair. Uh, the, uh, thank you, uh, uh, members of the National uh, Portfolio Committee on Health and uh, the Select Committee on Health and Social Services. And good morning to the Minister and the MEC. The, <coughs> excuse me, the, the presentation, um, I don't know whether the, the team from the National Assembly will assist with the presentation or should I put on the slide? Uh, 
Th that is your discussion with them. Whichever way is easier for you or for them, please do that one. Thank you, uh, uh, Chair. I'm going to put the slides on. I hope the slides are visible, Chair. Excellent. We can see them well. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, we, we are going to give just the outline of the presentation. I'm just putting it on slideshow. Um, the, the presentation is going to touch on the epidemiology. We will quickly update the figures as we talk uh, because we, we, we were not able to put um, a picture of the latest update. And we are going to show how we are preparing for a response in a military fashion to ensure that we respond, respond with agility and precision. And uh, some suggestions that we have put forward to the province, which we are busy discussing with districts in the service delivery model of hub and spokes. And we'll touch on um, a critical component of the response, which is the, the field hospital and uh, issues of uh, oxygen supply and uh, the work that uh, is required and has started happening about resolving re labor relations problems and uh, human uh, resource interventions. So we are going to start then with the epidemiology, which is going to be given by uh, Prof. Ian Sane. Prof. Uh, good morning, members of the portfolio committees. Um, Chairperson, Minister of Health, Deputy Minister of Health, and all members. Uh, I, uh, I would like to start the discussion on the uh, epidemiology as it impacts on the health system by um, reviewing the definition that the National Department of Health is, uh, is using to settle the conversation uh, across the uh, portfolio of the various provincial departments of health. Uh, we do this to ensure that indeed the uh, definitions and uh, therefore the numbers and quantities of beds that are being prepared are adequately um, defined. Uh, the, a quarantine bed is a bed capable to uh, house a person that did not screen or test positive. So these are intended <coughs> to be prevent uh, people who may be exposed to COVID in uh, the environment uh, from becoming COVID positive, such as family members. Uh, an isolation bed, on the other hand, is a capacity that is um, used to uh, engage or to house a person who is positive has a little or no symptoms, but is and uh, but is unable to isolate at home. A general ward bed is a a bed in a medical or surgical ward in a hospital uh, that is uh, for somebody who has screened positive with mild to moderate symptoms. Uh, we may have admissions into these beds uh, in wards for patients under investigation, uh, and uh, we may in fact have temporary facilities for general ward beds. They do usually, in general ward beds, we are anticipating that 80% will require supportive treatment and oxygen administration. In a critical care bed, the bed this is a bed type that it requires uh, where the patient requires major system support, including respiratory support and clinical monitoring, uh, which is usually accompanied by clinical expertise, supportive systems and equipment. Uh, this type of bed includes intensive care beds, as uh, we would all um, uh, understand those with ventilators, but also could include high care beds, 
and uh, potentially uh, temporary decanting facilities earmarked for critical care. Um, this is an important term when we discuss the uh, Volkswagen Field Hospital and the capability of the province to respond to the pandemic. Uh, we are um, planning into the language palliative or end of life care beds. These are, this bed type is capable of providing end of life care, including palliation uh, and supportive care could include the administration of oxygen to reduce discomfort and, uh, and pharmaceutical measures to ensure comfort. Uh, this uh, becomes very relevant uh, should the health healthcare system continue uh, to be under pressure and triage uh, guidance is implemented, uh, preventing the routine access uh, to treatment uh, facilities. Um, this uh, slide, um, Chairperson, uh, is a um, from the 17th of July. Uh, the reason we have kept it in this presentation is because we have, in fact, um, had the uh, the same presentation to the Premier and, and we've kept it for consistency. Uh, the In this slide, the total case number in uh, the Eastern Cape is represented as 58,860. Uh, the, the tally last night announced by the Minister um, is indeed 66,759, representing a, um, a substantive increase. However, uh, it is fairly consistent that the um, Eastern Cape is contributing approximately 17% of the national cases. You will notice on the slide that indeed the metros still make up the majority of the uh, cases in in uh, the Eastern Cape, but we are concerned that the uh, more remote districts of the Eastern Cape are substantively affected. And uh, our planning um, uh, interventions, the planning interventions of the Eastern Cape are including a, a scaling of um, activities in all of the districts. Uh, to represent this in terms of number of cases, um, we have asked the National Modeling Consortium to in fact break down uh, the revised modeling data um, to in fact look at the Eastern Cape and uh, to prepare for the, uh, to tell us how to prepare and at what level to prepare the facilities in the Eastern Cape. Uh, you'll notice that we have ringed here in uh, in these very, very bright red rings um, the anticipated peak incidence of COVID in the province. Uh, these are for symptomatic cases, Remem remembering that at, at we, approximately 55% um, of cases uh, do not uh, in fact have uh, symptoms and often go undiagnosed. Um, the representation here in the dark line is the um, the median uh, that that has been projected forward. Uh, the peak rising to approximately 90,000 cases um, in the uh, month of August. The hospitalization represented in the slide below. Uh, it, there is a spread of hospitalization with the peak lasting of between August and September. This is due to the um, delay in uh, onset of severe symptoms and therefore the delay toward hospitalization. And it is representative of the duration of the people stay in the patient stay in hospital. Similarly, the peak uh, in critical care beds is represented on the right uh, and between general ward beds plus critical care beds the numbers are represented in the text 5,418 general ward beds and 1,796 critical care beds. I would ask you to remember this figure because we're going to come back to that figure 
in the preparatory work that is being undertaken in the province. Um, at this uh, point in time, there uh, is an anticipated 9,000 deaths in the province. Uh, we um, use an, um, an although, albeit unfortunate and very sad term, but it is the epidemiologic term of unavoidable deaths. Uh, these are deaths that will occur despite intervention and relate to the nature of the disease. Uh, but, however, we are concerned that if we do not increase the capacity in the Eastern Cape, that this, death, this number of deaths will exceed 9,000. Uh, we have indeed um, also um, put into our data here, uh, the Epidemiologic Modeling Consortium has used an average uh, ICU stay for those patients that are ventilated of 19 days. Uh, with a range of 15 to 37 days. This is based on the Western Cape uh, data experience. On my next slide, and uh, Chairperson, you'll stop me if these are not projecting, a uh, marginal deficit uh, in the general ward beds. So on this slide, we represent the districts in a variety of colors represented in this graph on the, on the left. Uh, that uh, really describes uh, what we expect the various uh, districts uh, to um, epidemic to go, that how they will go through the epidemic, and when this each district will peak. Uh, we are certainly seeing the Nelson Mandela Bay Metro uh, escalation now in the month of July, but have indicated to our provincial colleagues that indeed uh, the uh, our bigger concern is in fact the OR Tambo district, uh, which will peak um, with a delay into September. Uh, we have translated these um, these peak requirements in in medical cases uh, to beds in the province. And the general ward beds at 65% of at all general ward uh, beds available in the province, um, we uh, have in the highlighted in the pink here uh, the um, number of beds uh, that we have in reserve. If it's a positive number, this is this is uh, added capacity that we have in reserve. Uh, the only um, district that uh, we see a general ward deficit at this time is Alfred and Zor district. Based on, uh, and you'll notice down here that the uh, uh, Reverend Dr. Chibula Field Hospital, we have in fact not included the numbers, and so there is indeed additional reserve capacity uh, through the uh, so called uh, Volkswagen Field Hospital, now named Dr. Reverend Chibula uh, Hospital. Uh, and uh, so this capacity is in addition to. Uh, we do think that even in the general ward beds that this is a very important rational capacity that has been built and needs to be operationalized as soon as possible. Uh, where we are concerned is on the next slide, which is the significant uh, capacity uh, that needs to be increased or so-called surge capacity to meet the demand of the critical care admissions. And again, the graphs follow. They are a little delayed compared to the previous slide that you saw. That again is the nature of the disease. It is usually only in the later part of the second week and in the third week of infection that indeed uh, patients progress to requiring uh, more than 60% oxygen support uh, requiring the CPAP instruments developed by the National Ventilator Program or high flow nasal cannula oxygen. You'll notice here that we've posted the ca existing capacity in the various <coughs> districts. Uh, important to notice that the more remote districts indeed do not at this time have any critical care bed capacity. Um, or registered ICU capacity or high care capacity and routinely refer patients to the metros. Uh, 
Um, the, however, there is an immediate, even if we use, uh, if we only take 50% of the demand into account, um, so in other words, only 50% of those who require critical care will present to, the, to these facilities, we already have a substantive deficit in critical care capacity. Uh, the, uh, if we were to uh, take this um, in, uh, into account, so in, in essence, if we now take the public and the private capacity into account, uh, then indeed uh, we still have a very substantive deficit that needs to be addressed. Uh, in the Nelson Mandela Bay Metro, uh, the um, authorization uh, of the collaboration with Volkswagen uh, to in fact build phase 2A of that facility will add another 320 critical care, potentially critical care beds with oxygen uh, addressed. So in other words, we can in fact do CPAP and high flow nasal cannula oxygen in that facility. Um, that 320 beds will be on top of the 268 beds available. Important to note is that we are likely to need another field hospital facility or increased capacity in the Buffalo City Metro, not because their deficit is massive, but because of the referral routing to these facilities. Um, a little later, I will come back to speak about the oxygen um, uh, capacity that uh, will be <coughs> enhancements that will be made uh, in the uh, in the Eastern Cape District hospitals, uh, in particularly in the more remote districts, uh, to ensure that we can deliver oxygen to all patients. Uh, so, in terms of actions required that we are addressing together with uh, uh, MEC and the colleagues from the Department of Health, uh, we are um, emphasizing an um, urgent um, and sustainable effort to improve the strategic information within the province. This work is supported by the WHO and by right to care, but uh, is focused on strengthening the existing SI team uh, in the province. Uh, we wish to ensure that we have daily updates of um, hospital admissions uh, to be able to monitor any district that may be overwhelmed, uh, where urgent temporary capacity needs to be put in place, such as a field hospital. I'm going to pause there and hand back to Dr. Zungu for the organizational arrangements and thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, the, the members of the Portfolio Committee and uh, the members of the Select Committee. The province had uh, responded to COVID by creating a structure to respond to COVID. We have just uh, come in to strengthen that particular structure with a proposed um, uh, COVID-19 uh, command and control setting for agility. We, we have a structure that uh, looks at the provincial command council and um, then focuses on the Department of Health in particular to, to provide a, um, a, a more agile and responsive a structure that works at a provincial level, at district level, and at a facility level. We call the provincial level, which is uh, immediately under the MEC and assisting the HOD, sitting with the PMU. Where the PMU is sitting is uh, right here. And uh, there, the province had uh, created the business continuity unit the health information is what we have uh, added in for, for, for strengthening the response. And then the healthcare stream and the, the, the health support stream. And what we, we have put uh, as the red points that you see is the nine strategic priorities that uh, the World Health Organization has put forward to ensure that we have a, a solid response 
to COVID-19. And then to support the district, the, the, the province had created um, or seconded uh, managers from head office to look after regions. And uh, there are four regional managers uh, that are supporting two districts each. And the silver command of uh, that area and the districts is then um, replicating what is done at a central level to the districts and then again at uh, the hospitals, different hospitals and uh, depots and ambulance spaces, the same happens because at every level there needs to be a level of response that is ensuring that there is adequate um, uh, uh, information being generated and there is movement on, of information from the center to the lowest level of the health system and vice versa. And uh, we, we have identified the, the actions required and the superintendent general of the department has adopted the command and control structure. And this has also been supported all the way up to the provincial command council. And at this point, uh, we have been um, a, a, a allowed to create an incident management space that will be supported by strategic information to ensure that at any given time in the province, the province is able to see what is happening everywhere, how the bed status looks, how many beds are occupied and so on. This is still work in progress as we, we started as the PMU was, was being created and uh, we are going to be having that uh, room that has been assigned to us to do this work and ensure that every time a manager in the province needs information in the district, in a facility, they are able to get that information at uh, the click of the button. And uh, the same principles are going to be used at every level of the health system. And at the district and regional uh, level, the, the structure will, will be similar to what we have done at provincial level and uh, we have some resources that are going to be distributed to the district levels to, to empower the district managers to understand the epidemiology of the, of the pandemic at their districts. And we found that in the province, they also have um, quite a good interaction at a ward-based level, and uh, we are going to be able to put that uh, together to ensure that our response is involving the communities at, as well. And then the bronze command is for a facility and to ensure that whether it's emergency services or lab services, there is coordination so that the responses are fed in and uh, the, if there is a challenge, it has to be unblocked immediately in a, in a manner that is agile and um, precise. There are other general co co considerations that we have uh, put forward and uh, we are having meetings uh, on, on, a, on a daily basis with the managers at different levels and with the, the issues that we, we, we have uh, looked at, we, we, we have um, thought that um, we, we need a baseline to understand clearly how many beds have been set aside. Every day, the province is making efforts to find additional beds, to look at uh, facilities that are no longer in use and ensuring that those facilities are cleaned up and uh, add more beds. But there are requirements of staffing, there are requirements of uh, oxygen and so on. But this is a work in progress, but already there are a number of facilities that were initially not in the plan, but that are coming in, adding quite a, a sizable number of beds that will be available per district to assist the, the system to change the picture that was presented earlier on in the, in, in, in the, in, in the presentation. And uh, the, the strategy that we are putting together is being communicated. At this point, we have communicated with other departments in the province in the, in the PDOC led by the DG, and uh, we, we are preparing communication to ensure that this type of understanding goes right down to the lowest level of the system. 
what we have also done is to propose a service delivery model. This service delivery model looks at the whole province and then breaks the province down to look at uh, the pe peculiarities of each district. And uh, it is at this point being um, discussed with the district managers, the regional managers, and the managers at uh, headquarters to look at what is the most feasible way of rearranging the, the system just for COVID and also to ensure that anybody that requires medical attention in any corner of the Eastern Cape is able to get uh, the, that assistance for at a time that is maximally two hours that an ambulance can move. So in, in, in we call it hub and spoke. And uh, what we are looking at is um, the three regions that uh, have a, a, in the referral pattern currently, where you find tertiary or academic hospitals with existing ICU beds. What we, we are doing is to look at those uh, um, facilities that are already in existence, that already have the capacity, and look at which other facilities can be strengthened to, to, to form mini hubs so that they feed into that particular facility so that it doesn't get under strain with all the, the patients in the in the province or in the region where that refers to it, referring to it, to, to the particular way, the facility. What we have looked at is issue of travel times, looking at distances, looking at the road infrastructure and seeing what will be the best way to deal with the issues. We are going to also take to the national level some of, our, of the issues we have looked at that pertain to the proximity of some of the facilities of the Eastern Cape to regional or tertiary facilities in other provinces and uh, to ensure that uh, the, the patients in the Eastern Cape have equitable access to services. We are entering into negotiations with other provinces so that our emergency services can move patients to facilities, even if it's in other provinces. These are the three regions where we have uh, tertiary facilities. We are looking at uh, the facilities in OR Tambo district and looking at facilities in the Buffalo City Metro and facilities in Nelson Mandela Bay where the tertiary facilities are located. And we will use uh, um, Alfred Nzo and um, OR Tambo district to see that uh, the hub or the needers is at um, the, 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 the OR Tambo uh, district and uh, we look at uh, the Mtata uh, and uh, the, the Nelson Mandela um, uh, 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 tertiary hospital. And if we look at the other hospitals in the f f uh, periphery, in Alfred Nzo district, at this point, we do not have a facility that has critical care capacity. However, it is not like we cannot develop that critical care facility. The province has identified some of the facilities that can be strengthened and some of the facilities that are much closer to the neighboring province in, the, in, in uh, Alfred Nzo where the patients could access the services. So the, the, the hub and spoke then goes into looking at um, the distances that uh, you can travel from the furthermost, um, for the furthermost facility and if you were to take things as they are to access critical care, it will mean you have to go to uh, the Nelson Mandela Academic Hospital, which for some of the of the patient could, could mean a four and a half hour drive. And um, depending on the road infrastructure, it could be quite a hard way to take a patient somewhere. And then what we, we have looked at, if you look at um, the, the 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 areas that we are suggesting that could create some of the hubs there are facilities that uh, have been uh, recently built and built with modern capabilities that can be strengthened to create halfway uh, places to have a two hour drive in each in each direction and these facilities the way that we have indicated them there is also capacity in that where you find the, 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 the 
the red uh, dot, it gives you how much a uh, capacity exists in that particular facility in terms of bed occupancy. So like the, this, if I were to look at Dr. Mali Zompehle uh, Hospital, it will be seen that the hospital has um, an average of 87% bed occupancy. So already in terms of service utilization, the hospital is a used a hospital that has a lot of activity. But if you look uh, at the next one, it has a, a bed capacity of about 42, um, a, a bed utilization rate of about um, uh, 42%. And if you see that, then you are able to say, I could get beds in that facility, but those beds cannot be for critical care. Then you have to go and empower another facility like uh, this particular one to reduce the travel time for patients that could be admitted here if they are not um, in general beds and then be able to move to critical care beds to reduce the burden of the distance to move all the way to Nelson Mandela and Umtata. So we've used this as, as our basic model to ensure that uh, emergency services, allocation of, res of resources like CPAPs or allocation of ventilators, if there is um, a, a, a clinical capacity to manage a, a, a patient on a ventilator, the, the, the distribution of um, resources will be according to these uh, uh, distances and uh, also, it's not just about one district. We are looking at other districts as well, because some of these hospitals are closer to a, neighbor, a neighboring district. So in a way, we are starting to rearrange the services so, such that uh, there are efficiencies, both for patient care and for travel time for, for the emergency services. And the other area that we are looking at is the, the realignment of the emergency services bases to hospital infrastructure. We are aware that uh, currently we, we have models where we have EMS bases where patients can call for, for, for ambulances and be collected, but sometimes the, the location of the ambulance base creates a bottleneck in that it becomes too far from uh, uh, the, the hospital where the patient, the patient must be referred. So we are recalculating and ensuring that uh, how we place the, the ambulances will be such that it's placed closer to the hospital and um, some of the hospitals that will be referring hospitals, they would uh, need to have an ambulance sitting on, a, a, a standing on site for a quicker, a quicker response. What we have also done is to look at uh, specific fa uh, uh, facility interventions. We have gone down to facility levels to interact with management and with the assistance of the MEC, we have had interactions with labor as well and issues have been raised that are currently receiving attention uh, around all, all sorts of issues that uh, some of them have been in the, in the media and we have re, re, uh, developed detailed project plans. And for now, we are fo focusing on strengthening the Nelson Mandela Bay a, a, a metro health, health system with the surrounding uh, districts. And we have developed detailed plans for, for the main hospitals there, the main hospitals being uh, the Livingston Hospital and Doranginza and our next hospital that uh, will the, uh, attend to is Etenheg uh, Provincial, and, and then we will move on to uh, the Sarabatman district to ensure that um, the interactions between ourselves, the district, the regional management, we come to a, a, an arrangement to ensure that before we reach the peak, we have uh, redistributed the resources to ensure that everybody is covered. So we are looking A, a requisite uh, authority for decision making and um, the MEC has already worked on uh, one hospitals that of over a long time did not have a, a senior management and uh, at this point a, a, a manager appointed for, for Livingston Hospital and uh, there are a, a 
processes that are in place for procurement of equipment, uh, monitors, uh, beds, CPAP devices, and also the recruitment of uh, clinical support services. We are looking at um, uh, the task shifting initiatives where we are looking at look, finding assistance for the nurses such that we have uh, human resources that can do uh, some of the tasks that take time for the nurses, like the bathing of patients, uh, the, 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 the mouth care for the patients and, and all of that to ensure that uh, the few nurses that we have are engaged in a, a, a complex tasks that require the, the, a, a qualification at a higher level. And there are uh, interventions to address the unions already in the province that uh, the MEC has started with those issues so that at facility level, we, we have agreements of, of what to, needs to be done. At provincial level, Generally, we have an, a, a, an understanding of what what is to be done, and at a national level, there are policy guidance the, the policy guidance that is coming through to ensure that there is uniform application of some of the COVID-related human resource uh, issues. The oxygen supply chain management is also being attended to with support from partners. And uh, we, we are fast tracking the, 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 the creation of oxygen infrastructure. As it can be understood, some of our district hospitals are quite um, old and uh, their oxygen infrastructure cannot take on the burden of a uh, high flow oxygen and um, the need for large amounts of oxygen to be utilized per day. So the specific um, uh, efforts that uh, are, are being used is to, to ensure that at every level we have work that is being done. I'll, I'm going to focus on what we are doing at uh, Livingston Hospital and Doranginza Hospital in terms of the interventions. In, in, in both hospitals, we are ensuring that the health and safety standards are upheld and uh, there are project plans that are details that uh, are looking at management as already indicated at Livingston Hospital. We, we, we have now uh, put on a, 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 C, a CEO as the uh, MEC has done that. And the bed management issues uh, uh, to increase ICU capacity. There are a lot of spaces that uh, are available that can be used, spaces with um, a, a oxygen a, a availability. However, there is a lot of work that needs to be done to support the, the staff to, to deal with the fear of working in a COVID ward, to be supported with um, materials for protection, to be supported with in-service training, and also the management of cleaning services, the waste management, issues of uh, laundry and linen, these have been attended to and um, the mortuary management is, has also been given attention because uh, the, 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 the staff, the support staff sometimes does not get uh, focused on in terms of infection control issues and how the protective uh, gear is distributed to those that handle patients. So we, we also have some of the interventions that relate to the VW facility that uh, is named, uh, named uh, Reverend Dr. Uh, uh, Mamisa Chapula Nweni. At that facility, it's a huge facility that has a, a capacity to of over 4,000 beds if it's fully uh, uh, deployed. However, when you run such a facility as we, we, we are aware the, of the complicity complexities of running large facilities, you can find that um, there the, 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 the are challenges with infection control, there are challenges with them, um, with the deployment of resources, movement of staff, and to limit the risks, it might not be a, 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 a good thing at the end of the day to have patients that are in, in quarantine and patients in isolation and patients of critical care, all of them being in one facility without ensuring that you have put a, a, a great measure 
of infection control. So the, the interventions that are running at the moment is to ensure that the phase one that is currently operational and, uh, and, and is equipped is taken care of in terms of infection control. And if we look at um, what could be done going forward, which uh, pertains to the, the, the area on, on, the, on this side, the areas that are peplish are areas where we have uh, oxygen beds, which is the critical uh, commodity that we, we require to increase capacity for the Nelson Mandela Bay and also to ensure that uh, the other districts, especially the Sarah Apartment district, is also supported. So the, the work that is being done at this point is to ensure that um, the infection control issues are taken care of and to create an area of safety in the green area and create an area that once a, a patient enters in this yellow area and is in that side, that is a red area where possibilities of infection are high. So within the facility itself, there is work that needs to be done to designate these areas and ensure that um, infection control principles are adhered to. There are resources that have been uh, sourced and from the partner. There are about eight nurses now that are in place to ensure that they support the existing nursing management and also assist in the functionality of the, of the unit. The, the work that has been done is to ensure that that green area, there is an added barrier in this yellow area to ensure that the movement of, of facilities has a, a, in the facility has a, a, a handover type of thing where when you bring in clean uh, uh, things, uh, there is an area where there is a handover. There has to be somebody or some people that remain in this area to ensure that they don't go to this side, they don't go to the other side until they move out of, of, the, of the unit. And uh, the levels then of um, amount of uh, PPE that is utilized when we talk about appropriate use of uh, protective uh, equip personal protective equipment, we, we, we need then to, in each and every facility, ensure that such an arrangement is done to ensure that people understand where they work, when they work in a safe area, and when they work in a, in a, in a, in a, 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 a medium a risk zone and in a high risk zone, so that such a resource allocation is taken care of and there is an understanding of, uh, of uh, what, to, what is to be done at any given point and how to behave even in the other areas that are deemed to be green to ensure that there isn't a transmission of infection. So the other question that is in, on hand is then that um, this phase 2A that was referred to earlier in the presentation is an area that has oxygen and if it, it's not yet constructed, it, it needs to be built and there are issues of lead times and decisions to be taken. So whether you build the whole facility with oxygen or build this part to, to give it oxygen, you, you need to have a consideration that once you increase the number of, of oxygen beds, to cover the whole uh, facility, you will have nursing requirement and staffing requirements. And the staffing requirements increase when we are talking about critical care, because you, you have to per shift have one is to 1.2 uh, staff to, to nurse the patients, because those patients require critical care. They are on oxygen. It needs to be regulated. They need to be monitored. And it is understood that uh, the COVID-19 patients do change condition fairly quickly. And there is a, then a need to ensure that there is close supervision and monitoring. And if the patient needs to be moved to a, 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 a fully fledged ICU and be ventilated, somebody with a technical know-how, clinical know-how, will have to move such a patient. And the, the plan is that those patients will then be moved to Livingston, because in the Dr. Chabula uh, uh, facility, there are only five 
ICU beds uh, that are fully ICU that are available there. This is the area that uh, is still to be to be worked on, and uh, it's, it, it, it will be required that the decisions are made quickly to work on that. At this point, uh, the PMU is considering that that work and uh, working with the province to to finalise the decision making. And the, the actions required, I have already spoken to them and uh, the, the staffing implications for those uh, for those issues. And wh what is why this is important and to deci decide immediately. Once we build capacity at, uh, at uh, Dr. Chabula uh, uh, Hospital, uh, we will get uh, over 500 critical care beds in that um, in, the, in that uh, facility and if we combine those with what we have in the uh, Livingston hospital and we support Doranginza hospital we, we will be able to cope with the with the surge at, at, at the time that it comes provided we have the staff so we have prepared infrastructure we have prepared equipment now the critical uh, point, the hurdle that we have to overcome is to have the staff. Have the staff that is willing to work and have the staff that is uh, having the clinical expertise to do the work. And that is what we are working on in, at this point, looking at different modalities and also help, help, hoping that from a national level, we, we might have a policy directive that will assist to have a tap maybe even on the on the students because all the service areas might benefit from a, a, a senior students coming to to be support and uh, supervised whether it's emergency services pharmaceuticals nursing physiotherapy all these areas would be would be it would be helpful to have extra hands just to 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 do a, a schematic um, a, a representation of what we were talking about. If we are looking just at um, the, the Nelson Mandela, I'm, I'm sorry, looking just at uh, the Livingston Hospital and the critical need to ensure that we have capacity in Nelson Mandela Bay to cover all the other areas like uh, uh, Sarabatman District and the Nelson Mandela Bay Metro as a whole, we need to see from the point of entry at a health facility at the clinic level, we need to increase capacity at that level such that uh, the in-service training of the nurses at that point is such that they are immediately able to identify a patient that needs such care. Whilst the patients on chronic uh, medications and other non-communicable disease will be coming through, the, the transfer, early transfer of such patients and early access to oxygen will become important. And therefore, the district hospitals that exist in, in, the, in the area would um, be strengthened to be able to have oxygen supplies and even their casualties, the oxygen supply points are being increased, and uh, the, 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 also the field hospital then becomes a critical component in the fight against COVID in the Nelson Mandela Bay. And, um, and also we're looking at strengthening the regional hospital in Doranginza and ensuring that our emergency service, as they transport patients, be it from the clinic in the periphery or from the district hospital and, and, and all the way up, once the patient, the COVID patient is put in that emergency uh, services vehicle, we are strengthening the emergency services by ensuring that we do an audit of all the ventilation equipment in the in the um, ambulances and uh, ensuring that uh, the staff that we we have is also given in service training to ensure that they have capacity to handle a patient in transit that has breathing problems in terms of oxygen uh, supply chain management there is a lot of work that has been done and the the estimation that has been done in terms of the projections that uh, were presented earlier on, we will have six to eight times more uh, oxygen demand than the normal situation. And be because the patients will be on uh, continuous oxygen, the, 
the utilization of oxygen will then be, be quite high. And that is why then there is work that is being done together with the infrastructure in the province and the, the teams that are, are, are supporting from the national department. We have the team that is uh, working on oxygen with uh, Vets Health and Deloitte. And they, they are doing calculations per district to look at what the oxygen requirements would be. It, is, uh, uh, it has been revealed that uh, at this point we have uh, AFROX uh, res uh, resident with the uh, air separation units in, uh, in the PE area. And this creates a bit of a challenge in terms of distribution of uh, oxygen within the different districts in the periphery and uh, the district hospitals also in the periphery. So besides the issue of uh, oxygen reticulation at these facilities, there is an issue of uh, distribution of oxygen and access to, to oxygen. The, the oxygen tanks are now uh, going to be installed at most facilities. The installations have started in some, and this is to ensure that by the time we come to the surge, we have sufficient oxygen to assist the, the patient. The, the work is being uh, fast-tracked and there is uh, support from the partners and we have uh, received a, a, a commitment to assist in the, in the laying of the, of the slabs to ensure that the tanks can be placed on top of those uh, slabs. And also the engineers, there are engineers that have been added to the, to the province uh, through the Deloitte uh, Vets Health team to ensure that this work happens quickly and some of the work will, will actually be, be sponsored uh, from that side. So there are uh, actions that are required and uh, as we are confirming the hub and spokes uh, the facilities that need to be strengthened to become a, 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 a hub for referral of patients are going to be then strengthened with the oxygen reticulation uh, work and uh, the, the oxygen tanks that are going to be installed. It is a work that uh, requires, again, that type of negotiation between provinces. Fortunately, AFROX is involved as the, the main supplier of oxygen in the, in the province, and uh, they, they are going to look at their plants in the neighboring provinces to ensure that they, those uh, plants can supply the districts that are closer to the neighboring provinces. And uh, the, the the decisions on the uh, supply of oxygen, those are on the underway. And uh, at a, a national level, we also have had a, a resource that will be starting to support. Uh, in, uh, I'm not sure whether he has uh, landed in the province in uh, Mr. Christy Engelbrecht from uh, infrastructure as the chief director of infrastructure to support the initiative. Then we have the Vets Health and Deloitte team that is also supporting with the engineers and in some instances doing the, the actual work. And also we, we are just fast tracking and ensuring that the approval of, of phase 2A to add additional uh, oxygen beds to, to, the, to the Nelson Mandela side and uh, the enhancement of procurement. I am aware that there, is, there are some deliveries that will be made today from the, 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 the partners in, in the province to ensure that uh, the Nelson Mandela V Center gets more functional. The res resolving of labor relations issues is an ongoing problem, but is critical. Hey. We, we work together, there is communication and there is a willingness to from each party, both from the conditions of employment. Here I'm talking about issues like having to move the staff to support some of the, the districts within the project.
those issues that he can assist uh, the, the team, the PMU, to, to facilitate. So the PMU is focusing on a, 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 a couple of areas. Key amongst them is to ensure that the epidemiology and surveillance is, is data driven and the responses uh, to, the to the information that comes from the data are, are given at every level so that a hospital can respond quickly, a district can respond quickly and rearrange services if need be, and the province and control the incident management team requires to work on a accurate information all the time the of our facilities in some districts where connectivity is an issue and it becomes difficult to get updates of information timelessly because we need to work real time. These facilities will be supported to ensure that we can communicate frequently services and our uh, pharmaceutical depots. And um, the management of the VW Field Hospital is also a critical of having um, uh, employees for, for that facility as uh, patients, they have different needs uh, in each section of the hospital. The clinical care management uh, also requires a, a strengthening. set up for that. At this point, the, the province is also looking at, uh, as the new developments come from starting to see, even from the country, write-ups of um, drugs that are assisting, that are, are, are useful, that tracking the procurement uh, of a, a couple of issues from the oxygen supplies to other supplies to support the hospitals. Is, is underway. The Livingston Hospital has had lots of considerations uh, around the cleaning up and management of waste and, and, and all of that. And um, the hub and spoke model is what uh, the districts are working on at this point to ensure that um, service delivery is informed by uh, patient needs and is in the interest of all the patients. Chairperson for this opportunity to, to report to the uh, Select Committee on Health and, 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 um, and, and Social and also to the uh, Portfolio Committee on Health. Thank you, uh, Minister. And uh, Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Zungu. That was a very detailed uh, uh, presentation. We thank you very much for it. May I request the members to share the time that is still left, left. ask questions. Uh, I'll read your names 
please note your number so that I don't interject to save time. You come one after the other. Uh, I've requested you on our WhatsApp to ask uh, not more than three questions. But if you are generous, you can still keep it to two because the three questions will take us to 30 minutes. And uh, I'm into 30 questions. And uh, we, don't, we have about 40 minutes for response and your questions. And uh, please let me give you the order and then you come one after the other. The first member, by the way, honorable members, this uh, presentation was sent to us last night. So all of us should have it. The following members will ask questions. Honorable Wilson, number one. Number two, Honorable Van Staden. Number three, Honorable Chirwa. Number four, Honorable Ismail. Number five, Honorable Janji. Number six, Honorable Kwahobe. Seven, Honorable Jacobs. Number eight, Honorable Munyai. Nine, Honorable Christians. Number 10, Honorable Ndongeni. And the last number I have is Honorable Sokacha. Please, Honorable members, share within the time that we have so that we can then see how far we can go. Thank you. Start, Honorable Wilson. Uh, Chairperson, sorry. Uh -huh. Sorry, Chairperson. Member Baha also gave an indication that he need to ask a question. Please, Honorable uh, 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 Gillian, these this numbers I'm reading were coming in from the secretaries, please, and they were forwarding them to me. That's why I have a complete list. Can they, whoever is left out, send their numbers to the secretaries, please? Thank you, Chair. May I start? Yes, please. And the second one will ask immediately after you. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, and thank you to the Eastern Cape for the presentation. Earlier this year, we got a, when we were discussing the budgets, we got the um, AG reports um, with regards to performances, obviously, by the National Department and the Eastern Cape and all the rest of the provinces. And quite frankly, it was absolutely damning absolutely damning, particularly as far as the provinces are concerned, and that includes the Eastern Cape. Um, and particularly damning was the abysmal financial and management performance, um, where there was no accountability, no action taken, uh, and no improvements in terms of the management um, of the Department of Health provincial department of health in the eastern cape and it becomes fast apparent in this presentation that we are still in the same situation dr zungu talks about preparing for the surge when it comes uh, the horse has bolted the surge is here and from this report all we can see is this still needs to be done 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 there is no point in closing the door when the horses run. Um, quite frankly, I, I, I'm, I'm really frightened for the state of the Eastern Cape. Um, we are still talking about preventing deaths by making more beds available. People are already dying. What The question then must be, please, Dr. Zungu, update us here. What did you actually do in the hard life? Down. if you are only planning for this now when we are already in the midst of a major crisis. And I want to discuss the ambulances because this was one of the things you raised, Dr. Zungu. At present, the Eastern Cape has got one ambulance per 21,000 kilometers in the Eastern Cape. We are at a time where critically, and you talk about moving people to districts, moving them to different hospitals. But you've got no ambulances to do that. And I think the most frustrating part for me is you're talking about fast-tracking oxygen supply. From the day that this panic pandemic broke out, Doctor, one of the things that everybody knew, everybody knew, was that this attacks the lungs and the most critical part of dealing with a patient who has got COVID-19 is a supply of oxygen. And yet now, in the middle of a surge, when we have a major crisis, you are only now talking about um, fast tracking and oxygen supply. I'm very disturbed, and I think that we have a, a major problem there. Um, and I will leave the rest of my colleagues to give their comments. Thank you. 
Thank you, Chairperson. Um, no, I want to uh, just say the following. Um, we have we have a big problems here in the Eastern Cape, and I think it's not only in the Eastern Cape in other places as well. But the Eastern Cape is before us today, and we we have seen what is going on. Um, we can hit the hundred thousand infection mark by next week in the Eastern Cape, as early as next week, and. I can't foresee that this province is ready in any way to treat patients um, for COVID-19 um, in, 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 in any case. Um, I hear your, your plan, which you should have showed us this morning, of patients transferring from one district to another. And I want to, to, to um, collaborate with my colleague before me. There's not enough, enough ambulances in, in the Eastern Cape to do that. How are you going to do that? Just explain to me how you're going to implement this plan you talked, you, you showed us this morning. Just explain to me what is the time frame for this plan's completion because the time is already running out. There's, there's no time anymore. We don't have any time. People are going to die in this province by the thousands and we, if, because we are lacking service delivery in the Eastern Cape. So please help me understand how are we going to do this, what you have presented to us today. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Chairperson. I mean, I think the presentation is more frustrating more than it is relieving um, because we keep hearing plans and uh, intention to implement, but there's nothing really happening if we are being honest because we're not getting dates, which means we can't hold you accountable. We want dates. When will this uh, EMS efficiency plan come into fruition? When will this COVID management structures come into fruition? When will this oxygen um, increase of capacity actually materialize? We need dates um, because so far all we have is that you have plans and we can't hold you accountable for plans because what is a plan if it is not implemented? And secondly, uh, there was a protest on the 16th of July by community health worker, uh, community healthcare workers who've been on contract for eight, three months for more than 10 years, Abanyo. When will those community healthcare workers be uh, employed permanently by the province? Um, and thirdly, the minister deployed people not so long ago, uh, and then they comprised uh, recommendations um, to the province. I want to know what those recommendations were and how far the province has gone in implementing those recommendations. The, the, the intervention of the National Department of Health. What were the results of the intervention of the National Department of Health? And lastly, Minister, what really will it take to have you lobby and move towards uh, implementing Section 100 of the Constitution? Because clearly the province is under duress and they are failing as leaders. There's no uh, service delivery happening. NCC is watching at plans that we know for a fact will never come into fruition. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. I won't take much time. Mm -hmm. Firstly, I just want to highlight that, um, you know, in the presentation, you have stated your broad action recommendations to address staff shortages and uh, other essential needs at our health facilities. Uh, why was this not done at the initial start of the lockdown? As this was the real intention of the, of the lockdown, to prepare our health system. This has severely, mm -hmm. severely affected our health, uh, our health uh, conditions in the, in the Eastern Cape. Without sufficient health professionals, how is the Eastern Cape actually going to uh, survive this pandemic? On this note, I would like to ask how many health professionals have already tested positive thus far? And how is this further affecting the already shortages of health professionals at our health facilities, considering the already lack of service delivery at our health uh, uh, facilities? And with the uh, addition of the pandemic, obviously, uh, uh, this is severely affecting service delivery on the ground. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chairperson. Le let me first uh, appreciate the presentation from the team from the Eastern Cape. Chair, as a person who did an oversight in the Eastern Cape, I really would like to say to the team, though many things have not been done, but I can see the, the, the improvement in some of the areas, particularly Chairperson, in the districts that are more rural, because that was our concern as the, as the oversight team. 
OR Tambo, which has got 1.6 million people, is the biggest province in the what you call in, in the Eastern Cape that really was lagging behind in many of the things that were to prepare it, uh, to make it ready for the surge. But having said that, Chairperson, I also want to get from the, from the team. In the, in the presentation, there are, there are 9,000 unavoidable deaths. The, 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 we have seen from other countries the strain of, of, of that the people get when they have to bury their loved ones. But there is just a little, just maybe a line on the, on the, on the preparation on the mortuaries. I know people do not want to talk about death, but we have seen that deaths are rising and we are not yet at the, at the, at the peak that we are, said, we are told is going to be in September. Can we be told how, what preparations have been done? I know that the, 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 pro, the, province, the provincial district hospitals, most of them did not have the, 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 the oxygen uh, capabilities. But I am happy to, when I hear that, you are attending to that. But can we be given specific hospitals in the districts that have already been uh, 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 provided? With the with the oxygen, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Um, my question, I've got just three very brief questions. I think my colleagues before me have already covered the disappointments um, that we are now seeing from this presentation about the readiness of the province. And we can obviously appreciate the work that is now being attempted to being done by the national team. But the, the reality is that we are now at this stage in the provincial response and yet there are still things that are yet to be done so my questions are, 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 are around specific timelines because again while dr zungu went through great detail in explaining to us what still needs to be done and what needs um approval we are still not quite clear as to when this is going to be done particularly considering that the numbers are climbing in the eastern cape as much as they are so the first question is around what are the timelines for the field hospitals in in the province because there is one functioning field hospital that is operating at half the capacity in nelson mandela bay and it's unclear to us where the rest of the other projects are and how far they are in terms of completion. Secondly, the issue around rural districts like Alfred and Zorn not having critical care beds. We cannot be in a situation where people are traveling four or five hours to get to the nearest hospital. And so well, the question is, when are we expected to see in those districts those critical care beds being added so that we can take services closer to the people? And the issue around the oxygen supply, again, that's still being pending as the AFROX contract or, or, or the, the, the talks around that um, in order for us to be able to augment the, 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 the oxygen supply. When again is that, are we expecting to see that issue being resolved and we're expecting to see those critical services being taken close to people? Because in as much as Dr. Zungu has indicated that in the rural provinces, while there is no critical care bed capacity, people are being referred to the metros. We know that in a metro area like NMB, we have a crisis where Doranginza and Livingston, which are some of the, the facilities that have been at the forefront of this, have completely fallen apart. So if there's no capacity in rural districts, the metros are completely overwhelmed. What are the timelines in being able to see those critical care beds added to the rural districts um, hospitals like Doranginza and Livingston being capacitated in terms of staff, in terms of beds, and 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 in terms of some of this this oxygen supply. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson, uh, and thank you for the presentation. It is clear that there are challenges in the Eastern Cape. It is clear that there is an intervention from the Ministry and from the National Department of Health, and um, we must thank them for the intervention. But it is also clear that we are at a little bit of a late stage in trying to, to save lives within the Eastern Cape. 
I only have two questions. One is to Prof. Uh, Sane uh, um, and to uh, Dr. Zungu. Uh, when you speak about 50 percent, uh, 50 percent uh, 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 capacity, if we look at 50 percent capacity in terms of critical care beds and 65 percent capacity for general ward beds, my question would be what, when it's going to be higher than this and we look at those percentages as uh, as uh, uh, as trying to understand the need then we're going to be in serious serious trouble because already the deficits exist at these percentages of need and the second one would be where would we be able where would we get the healthcare professionals the eastern cape has always been at the back end for a number of years in terms of recruitment of healthcare professionals uh, to the province. Uh, even though we will be putting the beds together, we're having the field hospitals, we're having the uh, ICU beds, we're getting the oxygen, etc. There has to be a plan in terms of getting the necessary healthcare professionals. Thank you. Honorable Munyai, you are, num you are, you are next. After Munyai, it will be Christians. After Christians, Ndongeni. After Ndongeni, Sokacha. And the last one will be Baha. Can we jump you, Honorable? Uh, uh, Munyai, while you are still searching where to press and to go to Christians. Much. Um, uh, Chairperson, we've all heard the horror stories now that um, our colleagues have mentioned. There are horror stories that abound of dysfunctional hospitals, rundown clinics, overstretched nurses, medicine shortages, um, stock outs, as well as ambulances that have to date not arrived. Now, I only have one question that needs clarity at this point. This uh, meeting is labeled a national intervention to the province. Now, how is this any different from placing the province under strict administration? Um, I think it's imperative so that we can drive these interventions. This should now be seriously considered to drive the results to save lives and also to uphold the dignity of the people in the Eastern Cape. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Are you able to ask now, Munyai? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, first question is that the by the ministry, are they being paid by the um, by the provincial government or by the national government, or is both national and and, and provincial government? The uh, Dr. Zungu was uh, listing a number of the of the agencies or partners that they're talking about, but she was talking to them in acronym. So, if we could get the full names, please, so that we could be clear, uh, who are we talking about? Lastly. Uh, 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 Honorable Chairperson, I think uh, the detailed, because other than this, uh, Dr. Zungu was speaking about the detailed report with so far Assistant Cape, and I'm saying it will be with indicating specific intervention to areas in detail. So it will be uh, appreciated if those reports could be shared with us. Uh, lastly, uh, uh, Honorable Chair, is that Um, we could not hear your second lastly, Honorable Munyai. Right. Can we go to Honorable Ndongeni? Uh, Honorable Munyai will write the last the last part that he wanted to ask. Write it to us. Uh, we can ask for you, Honorable Munyai. 
Honorable Ndongeni. Honorable Sokacha. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Can you hear me? Kubera, Kubera, Kubera. Thank you very much, Chair. Let me also thank the team led by Dr. Zungu for the presentation that they've given us. I've just got two questions, Chair. The first one is around the demand uh, in terms of the beds uh, and the capacity that is there. The report has indicated that there is less capacity in some of the fa fa facilities and then there's absolutely no capacity at, at other facilities. Now, Chair, given the shortages of given the shortages of ambulances, Chair, the report has indicated that some patients will be transferred from one uh, facility to the next facility. Given the, 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 the shortage of, 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 of ambulances, I'm not confident that we'll be able to solve the problem. Now I want to check make sure that they beef up those facilities that don't have capacity at all. Then the second question, Chair, is around the issue of the organizational arrangements and considerations. I just want to check with uh, the team of Dr. Zungu. Do we have district managers? Are they appointed in all the districts in the Eastern Cape? And secondly, do we have CEOs in all the hospitals? And if we do have are they having the qualification? Are they qualified to manage hospitals? And then the last question, Chair, is around the appointment of staff. Dr. Zungu has indicated that there are extra heads needed. Does the province have a budget to make sure that they are appointed in those positions? Thank you very much. Honorable Pacha, we are the last one. Uh... Thank you, thank you, Chairperson. Let me also welcome the the report uh, as as presented, and and um, just highlight a few things that I think uh, are key to either the success or um, the fact that we will fail in serving the people of the Eastern Cape. One is the issue of the scooters and the 10 million that is allocated to it. Secondly, is the 4.8 million that was claimed by um, a, a, a public representative in the in the Eastern Cape in Oar Tambo and, and and the general theft that is um, on the on the rise um, when people look at the opportunity that is um, portrayed by um, the fight against the, the the disease that we are faced with now chapter in my question there's only one question that I have the question is that how do we then deal? With, um, with this disease adequately, if we have such um, issues on the rise, where there is theft, where there are people trying to enrich themselves while they are entrusted with the task of ensuring that they work for the people and the betterment of the people at large. Thank you, Chairperson. The last question before you answer, Dr. Zung and the team will be from my co-chair, Honorable Gillian. Honorable Gillian, your opportunity now. Thank you, Chairperson. And let me also appreciate the presentation that was given to the Joint Committee meeting this morning. Chairperson, I find it very strange that um, certain members this morning is trying to play politics with this deadly disease called COVID-19. Um, not so long ago, Chairperson, this joint committee had the privilege of asking the minister and the deputy minister to give assistance to, to the people of the Western Cape. When the Western Cape was the epicenter, of the spread of this virus, where people have died and are still dying in this province and across the country. I want 
to urge our members of parliament from both houses, Jefferson, to take this virus more seriously than taking it as a political tool. My only question that I have for the team and, and the minister this morning is if they can give us a time frame of this intervention, when the minister and the National Department of Health intervene in all other provinces, we could see the results of, of the intervention. For me, this, this is a turnaround to assist the Black Department of Health has assisted all other provinces. Also, not losing the fact, Chairperson, that the disadvantage um, circumstances of the Eastern Cape, known to all of us as historical disadvantages, I, I really appreciate this presentation. I really appreciate that the National Minister and his team and the Deputy Minister is taking the lives of all people very seriously across the country. So let me just share person, show the appreciation for the National Department. We're not here to play politics. We are here to save lives. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, honorable members, for your questions. And to my co-chair, the last question, may I take this back to the minister uh, who will then, I know the members were very specific about, uh, please, Dr. Zungu, answer this, that, and the other. But uh, I will refer firstly to the political leadership. The minister is here, the, the deputy minister is here, the MEC is here. Uh, maybe then let's start, and therefore they could decide how to handle all the questions. Honorable Minister, let me start with you. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, uh, Chairperson, <clears throat> honorable members, and thanks for the questions. Let me say that uh, I would love that uh, uh, MEC Gomba is the one to start because the question that the members are interested in is uh, more about what has been happening, uh, what has been prepared oh. <laughs> the, before the, uh, uh, during the lockdown. And so she needs to give us a sense of the beds that have been put in place and what they've done with the issue of staffing and uh, uh, what uh, the status is on the ambulances. And I think that once she's given us that, we could then ask that uh, Dr. Zungu can uh, respond on to the time frames. I will then come in on some of the issues because I think what's important for us to realize that there are problems in the Eastern Cape at the same time, some work has been done in the Eastern Cape, but there are shortfalls that need to be closed. Uh, so we need to just keep this whole uh, uh, situation uh, properly balanced. And so I would love that the MEC if she could be given the first uh, opportunity to, to respond. Thereafter, Dr. Zoom, then I'll come in at the end. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson. Let's do it in that order. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairperson, and, and, and I appreciate the questions. Let me start with the beds, Chair, from the first reports. Currently, I will be addressing new beds. We have new beds to the sum of 3,536. Allow me, Chair, to say where they are in terms of the districts. Nasir Mandela has got 315 beds, excluding field hospital beds. Sarah Batman has got 142 new beds added. BCM, which is Buffalo City, has got 280 new beds. Chris Sani has got 412 beds. Joe Gabi has got 66 beds. Or Tambo has 333. Alfredo has 160 chair. And now, excluding O, Amatole, has got 215. Within the 3,536, 1,613 is field hospital 
beds. And we are still continuing with beds. We have got areas that we have repurposed. We have got areas the way hospitals themselves have been reorganized, even to a point of rebuilding old hospitals where they just waiting for doors lining on terms of floor beds are already waiting to get into those areas in particular in Oshar Tambo and other areas also our field hospitals has started to be on like in East London Frey Hospital like in Alwal North and others are in the pipeline but when that happened it becomes a ten key so when a structure gets up beds are also part of that construction. I would want now to go to the issue of ambulances, Chair. Chair, in terms of ambulances, the province has got a, num a total number of 447 ambulances. Allow me again to mention them by district. Amatole has got 60, Alfredo is 65, Buffalo City has got 45, Chrisani has got 65, Joe Gabi has got 45, mm -hmm. Nelson Mandela initially had 40, but we moved 10 from OR Tambo to add on Nelson Mandela. Therefore, Nelson Mandela has got 50 ambulances. Sarah Patman has got 53. OR Tambo has got 64, which initially had 74. That then is what Dr. Zungu was speaking to, to say. We've started to look at decentralization of ambulances, such that in these cases of COVID, they are closer in facilities rather than being there in terms of service centers, and they are sorry about that, hubs. Let's get to staffing. I will here, Chair, start to speak about the intended number of new staffing that will only be looked for COVID purposes because we felt we cannot go the robust uh, winding processes of, procure, of, of, and of, of, of uh, getting staffing back. But what we did, we took the route of getting contracted workers in the areas that are needed whilst we're continuing with the normal staffing processes that are a bit laborious. In that, the projection is 7,438, but currently on our role using databases, using short advertisements, we have got more than 3,800 that are in. Those staff members are ranging between very few in terms of doctors, but more in terms of PNs down to even the last one, which is the cleaner that we've done through EPWP. In terms of the district managers and their managers, in terms of that, we've just recently concluded uh, some four spaces for district managers and continuing with the others. Not that there are no DMs there. There are, however, on the basis that the issue of DMs had to be elevated to being chief director, we had new adverts. And some did not meet it, though there were DMs in the past, but for the level of being a chief director, those are the four that were going to actually re-advertise. The other four have been concluded, and we've got chief directors, one of them being Nelson Mandela. And the CEO's issues, this is a long-standing issue, which I agree to. However, we have now advertised, hence we have cleared the very difficult situation of having to employ for Livingston, where now, fortunately for us, the CEO that was here during the, the, the disciplinary process decided to resign, and that opened the space. What we've currently done so that we actually deal with the gap was to put in Dr. Kamala Shah to act in the meantime while we're running adverts. And we're open to anybody who believes that in terms of CEOs, they've got people that are practically could fit the job, they can post this name so that we can approach them to apply so that they are part of the head. On the issue that I want to talk to in terms of infrastructure, infrastructure, I will not get into details much. It's quite a long report if I would get to that. However, I want to, suggest, to say that because of the directive that on the issues of COVID, infrastructure is led by the Department of Public Works. Department of Public Works only gets to us interests where we are actually saying this is what we must do. But the good thing about what we took as a decision is that we decided to renovate existing buildings for the benefit of having legacy that actually assist us beyond COVID. So what we're doing, we're not building new buildings much. 
rather than extending and cleaning and extending and adding beds on those. So many of them for now have succeeded in actually benefiting for that and we're still continuing. I want to speak on the issues raised by Comrade, I mean, Honorable Naledi, the issue of healthcare workers. The issue of health workers is not a straightforward issue for us as the Eastern Cape. Yes, we would want to actually deal with that issue as soon as is yesterday. But the issue of us getting that is that the matter was taken to national level in terms of negotiations, not the National Head Office of Health, but the negotiations and everything else is done at a national level in terms of what they would call, what they discuss as they discuss with unions and everybody else. But at that level, they're still hinging on two issues. One, the issue of qualifications and the issue of amount. For as long as the arbitration has not been granted and awarded, for us it still remains an issue that we are not clear as how we can actually deal with it, precisely on the basis that it attracts the issue on the COE. And for us to deal with it permanently on the COE, we need to be quite clear as to how then that would actually impact on the current COE and how that budget would actually have to be sourced precisely on the basis that currently they are paid on grants, not necessarily that they are coming from the fiscal fiscal budget. Uh, The other issue that I thought I should actually take up so that we deal with it is the issue of saying oxygen. Oxygen currently is actually commissioned completely with some of the hospital like Cecilia Makiwane, because at the time, you would recall that Islam Akwana is a new and an old part. We have revived because of COVID the new old part, which starts with the casualty. That casualty has been oxygenated, has been capacitated, and it has actually gone through completely in terms of its commissioning. So the old casualty now is relatively active. Secondly, Ibatawith and Victoria hospitals are already on the installation of Ibak. Because what you decided on the basis of the strain and the challenges of COVID was that we should actually install bulk uh, oxygen depots and points in our hospitals. Of course, with the rest, the assessment has been done, and now we are actually talking to ESC, to AFROX to deal with the commissioning of such facilities on the issues of this. I want to say I miss the fact that the whole of South Africa does have a challenge in terms of oxygen and it getting to hospitals. The consumption of oxygen at this time is quite high than when it was just normal health service delivery. But as the Eastern Cape were already on that, we are looking at already having assessed almost 80% of our facilities. I want to last finish with requesting that the issue of our time for 4.8 million Can it not be labeled to us because it has happened at a municipality level, not at the health department? So we're unable to answer for it. But on the issue of scooters, I want to believe that the school issue of the scooters is 90% solved at this time. Fortunately for us, on the basis that people started to actually speak fast about the cost of the scooters, we had decided to take it to a post award. an assessment and negotiation. We're completing that, but the mode of the scooter has been agreed together with the chair and the portfolio committee of the Eastern Cape that we can only be changing the modeling of the side cut of the scooter. But the need of the scooter itself is still needed to carry out aspects of primary health care, in particular, your CCMTD that actually will be helping us. Our community health workers, are going to actually benefit in using those scooters. They are doing all their work on foot. So I do believe even there, I have invited openly that our books can be checked. Our books can be checked as to whether we've paid. We have not paid out any money until we conclude and the premier gets on board in terms of pronouncement on the issue of the scooters. I want to end the chair and leave the rest for, and I hope I've started, I've tried to answer almost whatever is in the Department of Health. Thank you very much, Chair. 
Thank you, Chairperson. If we could ask uh, Dr. Zungu to uh, deal with the issues of time frames, I'll then do the roundup comments. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairperson and uh, the members of the uh, portfolio committees, the joint portfolio committees, the minister, the MEC, deputy minister, and uh, my colleagues. Um, Chairperson, in terms of the timelines that we are dealing with, for issues relating to creating labour peace and engagements with the unions, as I indicated, there are a series of meetings that uh, are taking place with the unions to address issues uh, as, as they come specific to specific hospitals. At this point, we are addressing the hospitals in the Nelson Mandela Metro, and uh, the, the work is um, ongoing at, at this point, led personally by the MEC for Health in the province, MEC Gomba. On the side of um, the beds and um, the gaps that are there, there, there are a lot of projects coming in, in, into play. And uh, as we indicated that there's the baseline and then there are numbers that are coming in and we are closely observing the um, epi uh, epidemic and its movement. What we do is daily meetings to understand what is happening at a um, facility level and respond from different levels to assist the province. And the, the, the way it is done at this point, actually except for what we have seen at the Nelson Mandela, the health uh, uh, district, we, we, we are able to cope at this point, especially around uh, Buffalo City and um, the work that is being done in, uh, in the OR Tambo district. The, the bed numbers, as they get added, we are adjusting, which is why we were talking about a dashboard that we are working on. Besides an electronic dashboard, we are monitoring the movement of beds daily to ensure that uh, we focus our attention where we are seeing gaps arising. What was projected in the slide was a long-term view, but as things change, we, we are going to be updating the, the slides as they come. And then on the issues of um, health worker infections, uh, unfortunately, as we have indicated that we are focusing on the infection control capacity that is uh, being developed, we, we have reports that we looked at uh, with the Occupational Health and Safety Committee. And uh, at this point, we have uh, had um, over 2,000 uh, healthcare workers infected. And unfortunately, some of them have passed on. They are in different uh, categories, some of them not really being in the in, in, in the uh, front, uh, in the forefront of the epidemic, but working within the health environment, and as such, we have uh, increased our focus on infection control, regardless of where the, the health worker would be, to make sure that whether in, in transit or at home or in the workplace, the health worker observes the infection control uh, issues. Um, in, in, in terms of um, the planning that we, we, we are doing, and uh, the work we are, with, we are having with other partners, we have uh, people from the World Health uh, Organization and um, uh, assisting the province with uh, epidemiology uh, uh, infrastructure. We, we have the, the TB HIV care that is also pro providing some uh, data management and epidemiology uh, uh, technical expertise. We have MATCH, the Maternal Adolescent uh, Child Health uh, Organization that is uh, working in the province, also supporting some of the districts in the province. We have uh, the Clinton Health Access Initiative supporting Dr. the... Dr. Zungu, may I request that those you write down and you forward it to the secretary so that uh, uh, we have that one. That one is something just for us to read. Please don't bother to read them here now. Okay. 
Thank, thank, thank you, Chair. Uh, th those, those are the, the areas that I thought were for us to respond on. What I would then request, Chair, is to provide the specific timelines because we have different timelines for interventions. Some interventions are at facility level, some at, are at provincial level. Some things have already been done and the MEC has covered uh, uh, the issue of installation of oxygen and the timelines and the facilities where the, the work has already been done. But I, I will then uh, Chairperson, request uh, that uh, we give a report that gives the timelines for the different areas that we had questions on. Thank you, Chair. That would be extremely critical, Dr. Tungu. It will help us to get the timelines with the items that you are listing. Now let us give to the minister to make his closing comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> Chairperson. Thanks to Dr. Zungu and the M uh, MEC for the responses. Uh, in terms of the health workers, <clears throat> our figures are just close to 2,000, about 1,799. That's on my latest record. What are what affected? Uh, and this is in the Eastern Cape. Mostly uh, those are from the public sector. And on record, four have passed and um, 864 have recovered. So we monitor these numbers uh, very, quite regularly just to be sure that uh, everything is done to protect our workers. <clears throat> we'll be issuing a statement later today that gives us a comprehensive view on this matter. Secondly, the point has been raised by the <clears throat> MEC about the numbers of beds that have been put in place. I do understand the members are a bit anxious when you hear so many things that are still going to be done. It looks like nothing has been done. Actually, I've been visiting this province and on several occasions I've gone to the specific areas to see exactly where the renovation, the new beds were being put in place. And so uh, I can attest to the numbers that the, um, the MEC has uh, indicated, but we have since looked at it and then felt that we needed to move the numbers based on the forecast that we're working on. Of course, we do understand that the forecast <clears throat> is a, a, a hit or miss situation. We've been looking at how in the Western Cape, in Gauteng, and in Eastern Cape, we have to be actively managing these numbers. So it doesn't matter what the situation is, you must always look at how your hospitalization rate is going and therefore respond as quickly as possible be, uh, de uh, depending on where you see the pressure irrespective of what the original focus was. The issue of, uh, <clears throat> of uh, staffing, we uh, are working uh, right around the country to uh, assist all the provinces to find more of the uh, of the uh, staff uh, of the pay of the of the space of the um, uh, human resources. What we are seeing now is that people are beginning to move between provinces, uh, depending on where people would like to to serve most. So you'll find that uh, you know if uh, East Western Cape is looking for num for for nurses, they'll come from KZ10 and Gauteng, uh, and now maybe later they, when there are spaces in the other province, they go back to that province. So this is going to be a fluctuating number. And uh, we're also looking at uh, uh, using the uh, nursing recruitment agencies. We've done that in Gauteng and we'll do that here. So one of the things I'm coming to assess is what immediate interventions are needed on top of the plans that uh, have been put in place. Then uh, the issue of home health workers uh, is not specific to the, West, uh, to the Eastern Cape. It's a, a national issue. Uh, there are uh, you know, uh, there are unions who are wanting to make them permanent. <clears throat> and then you have see that, that uh, you, you get strikes and so on. But actually, the nature of the community health workers, as it was designed, it was a community structure. It was not meant to be people who were on, a, on a, a, you know, a contract with posts being advertised and so on and so on. So I think that issue is something that we'll have to continue to engage in. Uh, I've been involved in this matter. <clears throat> uh, it has uh, evolved from various ways, where at some point they were handled by uh, uh, NGOs, and at some point they're handled by government, and we try to uh, arrange, uh, you know, at least at this point, the question of uh, uh, the minimum wage uh, has been taken into account, which I think has been very helpful. However, it's an issue that we will deal with 
uh, not as an issue of the Eastern Cape, but across the across the whole country. The issue of oxygen, we had actually indicated where we needed oxygen uh, piping to be put up, and that uh, whilst we're busy with that, of course, it became clear that we need to put oxygen on almost all the district hospitals because of the presentation of the COVID-19 situation. And so we've been in the past few weeks engaged with the uh, uh, the uh, manufacturers of oxygen to look at where they can actually speed up the issue. It's nothing new. Uh, the, the original focus was that we were going to run into shortages uh, in oxygen supply uh, probably in August and September. And so we are working on that process now of how do we increase the uh, uh, amount of oxygen produced. So we've actually agreed with the, uh, with the producers, uh, with the manufacturers that they're going to have to shift as much of the uh, oxygen uh, usage from industrial into health needs and they're also going to increase the amounts and therefore they, we were in continu continuous contact with them and therefore whenever we think that there's an area for additional need we put pressure to everyone to move and, and, and provide for that and this is going to happen up until we get over the surge. It's a daily management issue and we deal with it in that way. So Again, uh, oxygen has been made available to some of the areas, uh, but then we think that uh, there are more areas that need to be given oxygen. And when there's pressure arising, we have to put in concentrated uh, uh, oxygen cylinder tanks uh, and put them, uh, make them available. So it is an issue that uh, we are managing on a continuous basis. We have seen here that uh, the manufacturing of oxygen is uh, located in one part of the of the province and yet the distribution is in another part, which means therefore that uh, there's going to be lots of stress in trying to move oxygen to where it is needed. The, uh, <clears throat> the last point which I'd like to just mention is that uh, the members have asked the question about taking over <clears throat> Eastern Cape uh, Health Department. Uh, and uh, the, the question was, uh, why why haven't we done so? Uh, I, I do want to indicate that uh, uh, there are, the, the, you know, Section 100 uh, of the Constitution has got uh, two aspects. The one aspect, which is A, <clears throat> is the portion that basically, if I can read it for you, Section 101A that says, when a province cannot or does not fulfill an ex executive obligation in terms of of the constitution or legislation, the national executive may intervene, <coughs> excuse me, may intervene by taking any of the appropriate steps to ensure fulfillment of that obligation, including 1A, issuing a directive to the provincial executive describing the extent of the failure to fulfill obligations and, state, and stating any steps required to meet its obligation, and B, assuming responsibility for the relevant obligation, and then I won't go into the detail. Now, the reason why I'm reading this portion is because uh, I have found that in, in, the, in the preparation for COVID-19, every province has needed assistance. Every province has needed support. Every province needed for us to go in there to change their program, to change their strategy, to change their, uh, you know, uh, the way they were doing work, and to even reinforce. I have actually sent reinforcements to the Free State, and I've sent reinforcement to the Eastern Cape. Eastern Cape. I've sent reinforcement to the Western Cape. I've sent reinforcement to Houten. Everyone needed assistance, and we'll have to do it like that because we're dealing with a unique situation that none of us are ready to deal with. And therefore, the, to call for an immediate uh, <clears throat> Section 101 uh, so 1B one, one, one for the Eastern Cape is premature. Now. Even the Section 101A, I have not started. I have not written to the Eastern Cape and said, in terms of Section 101A, you are supposed to do one, two, three, four. The reason why I haven't done that is because they are not different to the rest of the country. They've got lots of challenges, weaknesses, and so on, but so has every other part of the province or of, of the country. And therefore, once this process that we are in phase, we can then go into a formality of issuing a statement that says, on terms of Section 100, if there's obstruction, reluctance, or inability to, co to, co to comply with those, 
then we can start talking about section 100p, 101p. So the, I think the members must be aware that we are aware of this as a possibility. We're not far, we're, we're still very far from it, but we are here to give support. We want to just assure the members that we will be in this together with all the provinces to make sure that we respond appropriately to the COVID-19. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Chairperson. Okay, thank you very much, Honorable Minister, for that candid response of yourself and the whole team. In my closing remarks, let me just raise this. Uh, uh, we get comfort to get such reports because um, uh, myself and Honorable Janti, Honorable Dongeni, we actually did oversight uh, in, in less than two months in the Eastern Cape. We are happy with the progress that has been made here and there. There are certain things that are actually making us not happy. That is why we are able to measure as to the progress in meeting some of those issues. We spend the whole day in OR Tambo district because that is the only district in the whole country where we are overwhelmed by infections being the rural district. Everywhere else is a metro, 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 as we heard from the president. But OR Tambo is our challenge regarding being the rural but having such challenge. But again, OR Tambo is a district that is actually championing NHI in the well, in the Eastern Cape. Of course, it's got huge, huge backlogs, even in terms of infrastructure. And therefore, we, we really need to be continuously monitoring, but we, it, couldn't, it can't be that nothing is being done there. We don't see progress. We'd like to commend you, Minister Mkiza, for among other people that you are deploying to them to support this PMU is the is the is the chief is the director chief director infrastructure because that challenge of relying on the public works and not saying look health on your own you need to have an engineer who is going to assist Dr. Zoom with the timelines as to when can this be done when will that oxygen be fixed this and that is very important so we really are thankful on that so look please keep on working on these challenges because you will give us a sense of comfort that you are there on the ground. You continue to deliver whatever you can. We'll continue monitoring and over, doing oversight on yourself like we do to other provinces. But I think we could all agree to say this report, until Dr. Zungu briefs us with the timelines here and there, we think we should really be accepting that reasonable uh, support that Minister Mkiza is doing in that province like it does in other provinces where we notice that there are challenges. Uh, look, honorable members, we thank all of you for being in this meeting. There's an item that was supposed to be dealt with. We, I've sent you um, a, a presentation. Uh, we will have to request the House Chair to give us another slot for next week because it's important when we have even received a letter from the Speaker to say, uh, Honorable Jomo, as the Chairperson of the Portfolio Committee, Please deal with this request that is coming in from 75 scientists who are saying they are concerned about the impact of health of alcohol on health. So we have already done some preparatory work. We have to request a meeting next week to deal with this matter. Thank you very much for your participation. Thank you to Minister Mkize, your team. Thank you, MEC Gomba. Thanks to all our members uh, in the National Assembly, my co-chair, uh, Honorable Gillian and your, all other members, thank you for your participation. Extremely fruitful meeting that we have been part of. Have a good day. Continue the good work wherever you are going now. Thank you, Chair, and bye bye to everyone. Thank you, Chair. Thank okay, you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Bye bye. I missed your voice. Thank you, Ella. Chairperson. Thank you, Chairs. Uh, Thank you, Sean. Bye bye. Okay. We prepare room for the sitting. Mm.